By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we open old school magic and we talk about it and we play it and we do all that stuff. Um, in the video today, I have a very exciting card, which is actually in here. It's just one card, but uh, it's something I'm going to keep this till last. Um, this is also a really nice uh, mill day because I'm actually organizing a the dark only tournament and I've ordered some of the dark cards. Um, nothing special in terms of value, but really nice in terms of playability. Um, so this comes from, as you can see, from Card Advantage Europe. It's a Dutch uh, seller. So let's open it up. There we go. Oh. Here we see it's quite a chunk. I always like, when I order, um, I kind of get carried away, especially when the cards are not that expensive. I'm like, oh, I could get that card. Oh, I could get that card. And, you know, I think you could already kind of see it. And of course, the, the shipping is kind of expensive when you, relatively speaking, when you buy cheaper cards. So I always like to just buy a big chunk, really take my time to make sure that, um, yeah, that I have everything I need and that I don't, that I don't, you know, regret something or forget a card and have to reorder it again, have to pay shipping again. So these are the good cards, I guess, in terms of condition. So you know what, I'm just gonna turn it around. Okay, so we're gonna start with just a nice token to protect the cards and we're off to the races. Do you not know what this is? This is actually a Fire Drake from the dark. And the nice thing about Fire Drake is that there are not a lot of flyers in the dark. So for this to dark tournament, I thought if I want to go with red, I'm not sure if I want to, but if I want to go with red, I'll definitely need some fire drakes. Okay, so this is another one, 4-4 four, four from the dark, art by Anson Maddox. It's a lot of mana to cast and it has regeneration. Exactly, it's a diabolic machine, just a big beater. And I think that regeneration makes it very strong. Next one up, we've got a 2-2 Mark 10 in artwork, and it is the Brothers of Fire. Again, if I want to go with red, I'll probably go with Brothers of Fire. This Diabolic Machine is more if I go through the green route, because I'll probably have a lot of mana then. And I can also play two colors, of course. So I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. So a full play set of Brothers of Fire. Really cool art. Again by Anson Maddox. For the people that don't know, it's a two red and one to cast. What does it actually do? Well, it's, it's a red Timmy. So you can play, uh, pay two red and one, and you can do that as often as you want. And then Brothers of Fire do one damage to any target and one damage to you. And here, Fire is never a gentle master. Very nice flavor text. It's really great to get rid of smaller creatures and maybe to uh, deal the little damage that you still need to deal, you know, with red. It often happens that you've got so much direct damage, but you just miss that last two, two, three points of damage. And with Brothers of Fire, you can do that. Especially late game where you'll have a lot of mana to spend. So let's go here. We've got a white card. It is a 1-1. One, one. And whoop, it says so already here. Witch Hunter does one damage to target player. It is the Witch Hunter. Because white is also for me a very interesting color in the dark. Uh, very strong. This is, again, one of those cards where you think, shouldn't it be blue when you look at the ability? So you can tap it to deal one damage to target player. Unfortunately, not to target creature. That would make it a lot better. Uh, but still, ping for one kind of reminds you of a certain card, right? Um, and then this ability, it's such a blue ability. Two, white, and one, and then tap. Return target creature opponent controls from play to its owner's hand. Enchantment on target creature gets destroyed. So... What's interesting here, it says return target creature opponent control. So if, no, if an opponent plays a control magic on your creature, actually Witch Hunter can help you with that. So it destroys the control magic and gets the card back to your hand. Um, so that is quite nice. Um, and besides that, it's just, it's a good card. I mean, you can unsummon creatures. It's pretty good. And it is a rare in the dark. People tend to forget that. So two white and two to cast is a little bit steep. I, I agree. And also the ability two white and one to activate. It is a little steep, but still it can work. And let's see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a card. 
I really want it. Um, this is my first The Dark copy. I had a few Chronicle. I have a few Chronicle copies. This is my first Dark uh, copy, Save Haven. Really sweet art. What you can do with Save Haven, it's a two and tap, remove target creature you control from the game. This ability is played as an interrupt. During your upkeep, sacrifice Save Haven to return all creatures it has removed from the game directly into play. Treat this as if they were just summoned. And let's see, it's art here by Christopher Rush, of course. Epic. Christopher Rush, for the people that don't know, he was the artist of Lightning Bolt, uh, Black Lotus. Just a very, very special magic artist. I think it's it's a beautiful and this card really goes well with, for example, a preacher where you steal somebody's creature and you put it in the safe haven. But besides that, it's also a great way to protect your creatures from removal. Somebody plays a removal spell. Okay, sure. Two and tap. I'll just put my creature in my safe haven. So it's really, it's quite nice. This is, I think, the most expensive card that I ordered. Um, it's really nice. Okay, so now we've got the X. Or shall we, let's start with the light plate. I don't really mind that much. So there we go. Yeah, this is an interesting one because remember, I'm thinking about doing, um, or I'm thinking about, I'm actually organizing a The Dark Only tournament. And I was, you cannot play Dual Lens, you cannot play City of Brass. So what are you gonna do for your color fixing? And actually Standing Stones can kind of help. Three to cast artifact, one and tap, pay one life and add one mana of any color to your mana pool. This ability is played as an interrupt. So the nice thing is here, this is just um, kind of a filter artifact. So when you have this on board, for your land is basically any color land. So they're, all your lands are turned into City of Brass as well, not all of them, because unfortunately you have to tap it. It will be kind of insane if you wouldn't have to tap the Standing Stones. Again, it's not you know, the best card ever, but I think there are decks where Standing Stones can be interesting. Uh, oh, let's see, it's kind of zooming out here. Can we zoom in back? Can we zoom back in again? There are decks where I think this can um, can be interesting, especially um, if you're playing the dark only, obviously, and you want to splash multiple colors. So Standing Stone's interesting. Um, next one, it's 2-2. Two, two. Sisters of the Flame. Yeah, so I just figured maybe it's useful if you want to have a lot of land. This could be useful. Let's just zoom in here. There we go. Very cool hair. Always reminds me of Queen, to be honest, when I see this. Very cool. Tap, add one to your mana pool. This ability is played as an interrupt. Three mana for 2-2 two, two is actually decent, and it also has a pretty good ability. So I think overall, this is a pretty good card when you're playing the dark only. And I think this is the same, right? Another one, another Sisters of the Flame. I figure if you if you if you're thinking about playing with Brothers of Fire, you have to add a Sisters of the Flame. Oh yeah, this is a card that I wanted. Not too long ago, I created a Halloween deck, and somebody said in the comments, "Why haven't you included a Scarwood Hack?" Because my Halloween deck was um, uh, it was inspired by Scavenger Folk, and so the whole the whole team in the deck. I'm just gonna gonna put a. a uh, a picture up of the deck here for you to see. My whole theme was Scarwood and inspired by Scavenger Folk. And somebody said, man, where's the Scarwood Hag? You need a witch in the forest. And I realized I don't have Scarwood Hag, so I ordered it. Um, and besides that, I think it's a cool card. One green and one, and let's see what it does. It's a one one. Four green and tap, target creature gains forest walk until end of turn. And tap, target creature loses forest walk until end of turn. So this actually can protect you from those uh, if you're playing with Urnum Jins, that you have to give your opponent Forest Walk. So if you got Scarwood Hag, man, you've got nothing to worry about. So Scarwood Hag. Next one, just an artifact. Christopher Rush Art. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is quite cool. The Ruin Sword, the He-Man Sword. Look at that art. It's just Christopher Rush Art. It's just amazing. Wow. Those colors, that orange. Beautiful. So this card is six to cast, which is ridiculous. And then you're probably expecting it to be a super good good um, artifact, right? Kind of like an early equipment card, right? You see the sword. Now, what does it do? Let's take a look. Three and tap. Target attacking creature gains plus two plus oh until end of turn. Any creature damaged by target creature may not be regenerated this turn. If such a creature is placed in a graveyard this turn, remove it from the game. 
If target creature leaves play before the end of turn, Rune Sword is buried. Now, the interesting thing about this is the part where it says target creature may not be regenerated this turn. I think Rune Sword can be pretty good in specific formats. I think, for example, in Commander, uh, I should say EDH, by the way, sorry. So in Elder Dragon, uh, it could be quite interesting because Rune Sword can take care of those annoying regeneration creatures that I actually play with as well from time to time. And Rune Sword takes away the regeneration. People tend to forget that, but that is what makes it somewhat playable. Like it's still six to cast, it's ridiculous, but it takes away that regeneration, which is quite a unique ability in old school, a card that can actually do that. So we've got Rune Sword, and then we've got a blue card coming up. Yeah, blue. Oh, yes, yes, yes. This is another one of my favorites in the dark, also because of the art. Yeah, I've always kind of liked the, the little kitty cat in the tree. So this is Flood for one blue. And for the people that don't know, um, we have a history of water here in the Netherlands. Um, long before my time, we had something that's called the Watersnoodramp. So it was a huge flood uh, that happened after the Second World War. And this was kind of the scene back then in the Netherlands. So it's an enchantment for one blue. Let's take a look at what it actually does. And for two blue, target non-flying creature becomes tapped. And what, if, what has always surprised me, or surprised, what I always felt was a flavor fill, is that you can actually tap blue creatures. You can tap a Lord of Atlantis with a Flood, which seems kind of ridiculous. I think this card should have had um, target non-blue, non-flying creature becomes tapped. And maybe then it stays tapped until the next upkeep, something like that. Make it a little better, and then maybe make it three blue to use or whatever, but really make it a blue heavy card. I kind of feel that that would have made Flood far more interesting, but still, I'm thinking in a the dark only environment where you hardly have any flyers, I feel that Flood can be a really good card. Uh, let's take a look, what's next? Another one too, well that must be another Drake. Exactly another Drake, and this is also another Drake. So I've got three Drakes, I think I now own a play set of these. Um, and there we go. So there's a lot of the dark cards here. This, I think, let me know in the comments below what you think of this card. I think it's incredibly interesting. So it's dark card of the woods, one green and, and black, one of the only golden cards in the dark. It's an enchantment. And it reads, you may sacrifice a force to gain three life. Counts as both a black card and a green card. I think this is an extremely strong ability, especially when you have a strategy where you simply need to buy time. I can, I, maybe it's me, but I can really see this card work. And I know it's actually not me because I've seen it in lists and in old school decks. Um, I'm still curious about your opinion though. What do you think of Dark Heart of the Wood? Um, would you use this card? And if so, in what kind of build would you use this card? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm interested, let me know. Next one up, a green card, 4-5, yes. Yes, this is a pretty good card. It's Carnivorous Plant, one green and three, so the same casting cost as the Urnum Jin, but then it has no downside. Oh wait, it does, because it's a summon wall, so you cannot attack with it. Still, it is a 4-5, and I kind of, I love walls that have a lot of power. There are not a lot of walls in old school that have a lot of power. Toughness, yes, but power not. So this Carnivorous Plant can take care so many uh, opposing creatures, it's a really nice standstill. And that art, very cool here, you see that mouth, wow. Flavor text is nice as well though, I'm not, as well, though. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but it's, uh, it's really nice. So if you have time, you can pause it now and you can actually read the flavor text, it's quite nice. Of course, Quentin Hoover art, beautiful. So carnivorous plant, next one up, it's another carnivorous plant. Another carnivorous plant. Hey, ah, this card is very interesting. Tangle Kelp. This card hardly sees any play in old school, at least not in my group, but I think it's quite interesting. One blue, an enchant creature. And let's see what it does. Target creature does not untap during its controller's untap phase if it attacked during its controller's last turn. So that's quite interesting. So, if it attacks, then it doesn't untap the next turn. So that, I think, makes Tangle Kelp quite an interesting card. Now, there's also another part of the card that it makes me realize, uh, it makes me uh, think of, sorry, makes me think of Paralyze. 
And you see that here, target creature becomes tapped when Tangle Kelp is cast. So that is quite interesting. So it taps the creature immediately, so it opens the road for you. I think, I think that's fascinating. The problem here in the dark only is I can see Maze of If being a problem because now with the new rulings, what you can do with Maze of If, you can attack with your attacking creature. After you've dealt damage in the combat phase, you can use your Maze of If to untap your creature. Then obviously Tangle Kelp doesn't work anymore. However, it still works in an um, aggressive strategy where you want to tap down your opponent's creatures. So I, I find it interesting. I believe, yeah, I have a full playset here and here we see another... Just another new card, I guess, uh, to protect the older cards. So a nice playset of Tangle Kelps. I think it's I think it's a pretty good card. Like it's not a super good card, obviously, or you would have seen it more. But it is one of those interesting cards where I think, you know, I think we can do more with this than than just not playing with it. Anyway, um, Tangle Kelp playset. So as you can see, I'm kind of my idea for my the dark deck is going everywhere at the moment. I'm not quite sure to what color I want to commit. Um, but now, the envelope that at least I've been waiting for. Oh, there's such a cool card in here. Oh. I don't want to spoil it. Let's have a look. Yeah, okay, so we're going to open it like this. And here it is. This is the card. out of the bag if I can okay it's a little stuck but I can manage oh and let's see oh there are actually two cards in here well let's see the one that's in the best condition that's this one this is the one I want to show you. I'm very excited about this card, but this is also a beautiful card that I have in here. Um, it's an alpha. And whew, look at that. Wow, 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 wow. Oh, oh. The red elemental blast. Look at the art on this. Isn't that amazing? Look at that guy casting fire. Block in that blue spell. Counters a blue spell being cast or destroys a blue card in play. Richard Thomas. Absolute, absolutely amazing art. Um, the cool thing is I also own, and that's actually why I purchased this one. I also own a blue elemental blast alpha. So now I have one of both. So I'm really, really happy with this card. Beautiful art. Okay, so... This was already a great card, but this is not even the card I was talking about. This is the card that I'm talking about. It is in wonderful condition. Um, you know what? I'm just going to take it out. Ooh. It's always kind of when I take take out a card that's in such good condition. It makes me nervous a little bit, but here we go. Bam! It is the Argivian Archaeologist. Nickname of this card is The Shirt because he's, well, he is wearing pants, but he's wearing cocky pants and it's almost like he's not wearing any pants. This is one of those weird cards that you think, what is this guy doing in the world of magic? Like he's an archaeologist. It's more somebody that comes to a dig site afterwards to find the remains of this magic world that, that we're talking about within the game, right? He looks like a guy that's just a regular archaeologist in... in modern day, or at least the 70s or something. But of course, if you know the lore of the antiquities, um, archaeology and, and, archae and archaeologists actually play quite a big role. It's, um, it's, to my knowledge, also the set where the artificers are introduced. So artificers are people that look for old Thran uh, artifacts and specialize in them and try to make artifacts of their own as well. So what does the Argivian Archaeologist do for the people that don't know? It's two white to cast in once. It's from the Antiquities. And it's a 1-1. One, one. So it's a small creature for three. And then you pay two white and you tap it to bring one artifact from your graveyard to your hand. So you can imagine with certain artifacts, this is amazing. Of course, Chaos Orb is your main thing, but also 
Tris Kelly, and, and there are just many other synergies and, and really cool things that you can do with this card. The problem, of course, being that it's, it's pretty much white committed with the double white casting cost and also the double white in uh, its activation. In my opinion, you can, you can use this card in multiple ways for multiple reasons. You can say, I'm gonna just put a one-off in and maybe play late game as a surprise and you know get my most powerful artifacts back out of my graveyard and get the victory. Or you could say, I'm gonna have two or three of them in my deck and really build my strategy around it. Another thing that you can do is say, you know, this is just a, a card for me to catch up some removal. And then I have some plays, for example, to, to cast a Sarah or a Triskelion and make sure that that's not removed straight away. So there are multiple ways of looking at the Archaeologist. Personally, um, my strategy, I'm playing it in my Tron deck, and my strategy is I want to play kind of late game, and then I want to get back some of my powerful artifacts, including a Chaos Orb, right? Um, but yeah, this is just amazing. And for the, for the people that kind of follow the channel, um, you probably know that I'm really, really... Uh, crazy about antiquities. I made a whole video about it. Um, and I also have an artist proof. Actually, I can I can show you. So this one's going definitely going into my antiquities collection. And uh, I can show you the artist proof that I have, which is right here. So this is the Amy Weber, because she's the artist, so she made this picture as well. The Amy Weber artist proof. I can show you the front. So I guess I've got quite the, the collection now signed as well. It's one, it's just one of those cards that, that really speaks to me. Let me know in the comments below if you're also a fan of the Archaeologist and how you use it if you play with it in a deck. Um, this was actually it for today, a huge, huge meal day. So I just actually want to give a, a shout out to uh, Robby because Robby is um, a Dutch trader that got me these two cards for a very decent price. So thank you, Robby, for that. Um, I believe you're on Magic Card Market. If people search for for Robby, I'm sure you can you can find him. He's a good trader. Uh, same goes for all the beautiful the dark cards, by the way, from Card Advantage Europe. Um, if you enjoyed watching this video, uh, leave a like, leave a comment, share it on your socials, and um, if you're not a subscriber yet, please subscribe. It really helps the channel. You can also click a notification bell. I believe all that stuff helps. Another thing you can do is you can support the channel financially. So help me to get new equipment and to basically travel from tournament to tournament to give you live streams and give you full coverage. Uh, and you can do that by becoming a patron on my Patreon page. So there's probably a link popping up right now. Click on the link, have a look. You can already support the channel starting at a dollar. We have our, have our own Discord where we talk about silly combos. Uh, we have our own tournaments. We have... I don't know, we, we do all sorts of things. We have uh, giveaways, whatever. So it might be worth your while to come and have a look. And if you want to sponsor the channel, I would really, really appreciate it. Talking about people that I really appreciate, let's take a look at the amazing, the wonderful, the super cool patrons of Timmy Talk. Let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Ik het is, ik het is, somba kazee!